now an eight special presentation. This time on Artbeat Nation, a painter who prefers to stick to the basics. When you have all the technology today and the basic little brush that the cave guys used on the walls. A theater that focuses on art that reflects life. But I knew it was the greatest theater on earth. I recognized that mission as the most important mission that any theater could have. A musician doing her life's work. Playing the violin is what I was meant to do with my life. It's my calling. It's who I am as a person. And a stage set that rivals the show itself. Before the acrobats even start, it's just, wow, look at that. And then the good part starts as well, right? It's all ahead on this edition of Art Beat Nation. <laughs> Funding for Art Beat Nation was made possible by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. Mark Rubin paints life into everyday objects. By using light and shading, the artist paints a story into his still life subjects from flowers to watering cans. I'm a representational painter. I paint from life not from photographs, and I typically paint one-to-one, -one, which is literally one-to-one -one scale. But the size you see on the painting is the size of the object I'm painting. It's these little magical pools of light. This, there's, if you walk by something and it strikes you, the, the highlights, the kind of rembrandt -y stuff that really gets me excited. So when I see something that catches my attention in that moment, I try to bring it back to the studio and recreate that feeling and then paint it. I paint with oil and uh, typically on masonite. I do use some canvas, but I really love the, uh, the, the hardness and the pushback with the brush on masonite. I paint from life. Painting from life, you see the three dimensions. They're not flattened out by a photograph. It's not fake. The shadows have you know depth and color. I paint from the north light, and the shadows are typically red on the warm side. The highlights are blue because reflecting the sky. I studied with Tom Beekner for 10 years, and he's been my mentor, friend. He taught me more than just painting. He taught me the love of classical music, the love of opera. He introduced me to many, many books and many artists that I wasn't aware of. And his process is a renaissance process. It's been passed along from generation to generation. You know, the Dutch painters and Vermeer and Rembrandt and uh, many, many others of, the, of that era that I feel I'm connected to that. And that's part of the responsibility I feel as, as an artist and as accomplished as I am to go back and, and pass that along, keep that lineage going. I'm in five different galleries around the East Coast, and a couple of the major ones are the Fan Gallery in Philadelphia, the Zenith Gallery in Washington, D.C., and the uh, South Street Gallery on Long Island. It's really about seeing and continually going for the more representational, and, I, and the trompe l'oeil, which is ch having depth in a painting. I, it's really important to me to get that, this kind of illusion that things are coming at you. I like doing that as like, usually a shadow or an edge that kind of brings things more forward. And I like the three-dimensionality of things.
I like old things. I like things that have been have a history, or if it's a vegetable that has a little story to it. There's a narrative usually to the work that I do, like the tomatoes that are on the floor behind me. I walked into a local grocery store and they were kind of leaning. They looked like friends, but they knew each other for a long time. So I tried to create that feeling that I had when I walked through that supermarket and recreated that feeling through that little moment that I was interpreting. You know, the brush is such an this is amazing tool when you have all the technology of today and the basic little brush that the cave guys used on the walls. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. To see more of Mark Rubin's work, visit his website at markrubin.net. For nearly 60 years, the public theater in New York City has been a vital presence in the downtown theater scene. The public has fostered the talents of many great actors and playwrights, and has featured productions that raise social consciousness. Paul Azan sat down with the public's artistic director, Oscar Eustace, to talk about the theater's long history and ongoing presence as a cultural force. Oscar, it's great to see you. Pleasure, Paula. Thank you for joining us. I'm glad to be here. You became the artistic director of the public back in 2005, and you had had a number of prominent positions all over the country. I, I can only imagine when someone said, Oscar, we're interested in bringing you to New York, how you must have felt. When this job came open, I worked so hard to get it because it's the only job I've ever wanted. When I, was, really? when I was 16 years old, I walked into the lobby of the public theater. You know, that that's what a theater is supposed to be. You knew that at the oh, age of 16? I didn't know I wanted to run it because it wouldn't have occurred to me that I'd ever be able to, but I knew it was the greatest theater on earth. I recognized that mission as the most important mission that any theater could have. The public represents the idea that the theater is a democratic institution and needs to include everybody. That the theater is at its richest, not only when the audience is as diverse as the country, but when the voices speaking from the stage are as diverse as the country. And the public's goal is to make everybody part of the American story. You recently celebrated the incredible rejuvenation of the public theater. For those of us who weren't lucky enough to join that celebration, describe to us what unfolded. Well, the beautiful thing that morning is that we had about 25 actors and city officials and people who are important historically to the public do lines of Shakespeare. I was shocked by how emotional it was because it felt like this language is what we all spring from. Tis a lucky day, boy, and we'll do good deeds on it. You were better have a bad epitaph than their ill report while you live. Knowing I loved my books, he furnished me from my own... The list of actors whose careers have either been launched or reinforced by their experience at the public is really quite impressive. Let's talk about that. George C. Scott. Colleen Dewhurst, Meryl Streep, the list goes on and on and on. And it's not only that great actors have made their home at the public from all of the actors you mentioned, and Sam Waterston, and Kevin Klein and James Earl Jones, and the amazing Raul Julia, but they've made their home at the public in a way that has helped define what the American theater should be. James Earl Jones played Lear at the public at a time when it was sort of astonishing to have a black man playing King Lear. Raul Julia, when he did Taming of the Shrew, the Joe at that time, encouraged Raul to speak in the beautiful tones of his native Puerto Rico. So he didn't sound like he wished he was an Englishman doing Shakespeare. He was proud of being a Puerto Rican doing Shakespeare. Martin Sheen's Hamlet, where he played Hamlet and he did the to be or not to be in the accent of his origin, which was also Puerto Rican. All of that means that it's not just a home for great actors, but it's a home for actors to expand who they are, and ex by expanding who they are, expand what we get to witness and, and how we experience their humanness. This year marked the 50th anniversary of the Delacorte Theater. That's right. What has been the secret to having it endure and thrive? 
Shakespeare in the Park is so loved by this city, and it's because Shakespeare is the most accessible writer in the history of the English language. When people see him, they love him, because we are committed in the park to not just doing Shakespeare in the Park, but having the greatest actors and directors in the English-speaking world do Shakespeare in the Park. And then you couple all of that wonderful art with the idea that it's free. But you've also been very committed to taking the public's works on the road That's through right. a mobile unit. And I, and I love what you're doing with this. Shakespeare in the Park is free, but the lines can last for two days. So what we have to do, we have to go out to where people are who don't have the possibility of waiting in line. So when we go to the prisons and the homeless shelters and the, the various incarcerated audiences that we're taking the mobile unit to, what we're trying to do is say to them, this belongs to you too. Is the idea that the prisoners actually feel a connection to the actors? They not only feel a connection to the actors, they feel a connection to the stories that we tell. When we took Shakespeare's Measure for Measure into a maximum security women's prison here on the west side, there's a scene there where a young woman is told by a very powerful official that if you sleep with me, I will pardon your brother, and if you don't sleep with me, I'll execute him. And he leaves the stage. And this character, Isabel, turned out to the audience and said, to whom should I complain? And this woman in the audience shouted back, the police! And then she looked right at that woman and said, if I did relate this, who would believe me? The woman answered back, no one, girl. Mm. And it was astonishing, because not only was it an amazing sense of connection between the audience and the actors, but you also realized this was kind of a historical lesson in, in theater reception. That's what must have happened at the Globe. These soliloquies were not simply monologues that people spoke. They were call and response to the audience. And you realize that's, that vibrancy, that sense of connectedness, is not only what makes theater great in prisons, it's what makes theater great, period. Oscar, let's talk about this season, which you're well into now. Take us through some of the highlights so far. Richard Nelson's play, Sorry, which opened on election night, and it takes place on election night. He was writing it up to the moment of the election. And so it captures in a family drama the exact texture of what we were debating and talking about as the election happened. 27th Man, which is Nathan England, a great short story writer, great novelist, that we've converted him to the theater. Nora Ephron brought him to us. And he has written this remarkable play about five Yiddish writers in a jail cell in the Soviet Union. Giant, which is just a remarkable musical based on Edna Ferber's novel, and of course the famous James Dean, Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor movie, which is not only a great story about America, it's a great story about oil. And it's a great story about a long-term marriage, which we don't get very often in the theater. It's really just a great constellation of work. What can we look forward to in the spring? We've got a number of things this spring that I'm excited about. Um, probably the uh, sort of uh, most spine-tingling is David Byrne's musical, Here Lies Love, which is a musical that he's created with Alex Timbers, the author and director of Bloody Bloody Andrew Jackson. And we're actually setting it in a disco, so the audience will actually be in a disco and at the same time watching the narrative of Amel DeMarcos' rise to power and fall. And I think that's going to be just a thrilling theatrical experiment. What does the future hold for the public? What do you see as its relevance in this particularly tough economic cycle we're living through? So for me, the thing that's irreplaceable about the theater is the audience. The fact that you have to come together with a bunch of other people who are usually strangers. And when the theater works, by the time you leave, you actually feel viscerally that you're part of a community. You feel that interdependency, the fact that we're not in this alone, that we are all in this together. And that is something that in our increasingly digitized age is a more and more precious experience. And so I think um, we can't do without it. What a pleasure to spend time with you, you and I will be cheering from the sidelines. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Paula, very much. To find out more about the public, visit publictheater.org.
Rachel Barton Pine has a passion for what she calls life-changing classical music. The violinist began playing at three years old and has performed on stages around the world. Rob Stewart sat down with her to talk about classical music. We all know how inspiring music can be, and very few people know that more than world-renowned violinist Rachel Barton Pine. Rachel, good to see you. Good to be here. It's nice to be with you outside of the Sacramento Community Center Theater. You have a very moving message behind your music. Tell me about that. Well, um, I really believe that classical music is, of all the kinds of wonderful music that exists, classical is the kind that most brings people together. It's really a universal language, a music that's not of a particular time and place, but music that moves all of us in the deepest way possible and really uplifts our spirit. And it's my mission to share classical music with as many people as I possibly can. Now, you fell in love with the violin at a very early age, and boy, did you skyrocket to the top quickly. Ever since I started violin lessons at the age of three, um, I really felt that playing the violin is what I was meant to do with my life. It's my calling. It's who I am as a person. And all of the challenges I've had all the way through the years um, have never deterred me from that path. Because during my childhood and teenage years, my father was unemployed um, most of the time. And we never knew where the next scholarship was going to come from, whether I would be able to get a borrowed instrument and continue being able to pursue my dream. And holding on to my faith that music is the best way that I can um, share my gifts with the world. You inspire so many people through classical music. I'm curious, Rachel, how classical music inspires you. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a great question. Well, I mean, being a classical musician is fulfilling on so many different levels. Of course, um, there's all of the historic interest in learning about the composer's life and analyzing the score, and it's just very intellectually stimulating. And then, of course, it's fun, kind of like a sport, to get to play all those fast flicks and all those challenging notes and, you know, make yourself, you know, better and better as you practice and practice, kind of like, you know, doing Olympic figure skating or something. But all of that is just background to what it means to be on stage, which is really to fully experience the emotions of the music and even more importantly, to reach out to those listening and share those feelings with them so that everybody gets caught up in the music together. And classical music goes farther than any other kind of music in terms of expressing absolutely every possible shade of emotion of the human experience. I want to just share music with absolutely everybody. And that's what you're doing here today with the Sacramento Philharmonic. Rachel, such a nice time speaking with you. Thank you. My pleasure. To find out more, visit rachelbartonpine.com. As audience members fill the seats, theater productions require extensive preparation to set the scene for a show. That is especially true for Zarkana by Cirque du Soleil. Zarkana's technical director, David Churchill, explains the intricacies of the show's set. Inspired by the epic size of Radio City Music Hall, one of history's largest theaters, Cirque du Soleil's new show, Zarkana, is one of their biggest productions ever. Radio City played a huge role in the inspiration. I, I remember f sitting on the, in front of that theater and thinking, how, how the hell are we going to fill that place? We were like, oh my God, what are we, how are we going to do this? Because it was, uh, it's a big show. It's a huge show. With seating for over 6,000 and a stage measuring 144 feet wide and 80 feet deep, Radio City is large enough to dwarf any human even one performing incredible death-defying acrobatics. In the context of Zarkana, I think the, one of the biggest challenge was to uh, deal with the scope of Radio City. As it turns out, this theater here at the area is a, almost the same opening stage opening, like the proscenium march is about the same as in Radio City, which is taller than it should be. Like it's a, it's a really hard um, task to make the whole scenic cage live. To match the grandeur of the theater, Cirque's creative team built an equally grand, elaborate set. They designed three giant sweeping proscenium arches, a 90-foot video wall, and a gargantuan, fully automated tech grid. The logistics of doing this were, uh, were huge and daunting. David Churchill, a 12-year Cirque veteran, is Zarkana's production technical director. 
You know, I'm sort of like the conduit between crazy and reality, and we try to take the crazy ideas and turn them into reality as much as we can, and it turns into things like this. Moving this monstrous creation around the world and here to Las Vegas has been an epic challenge. Particularly because it was a touring show, it's kind of the biggest show on wheels that we've certainly ever had, right? Because it is a, a resident-sized show that we've been packing and moving around the world. And the whole thing has been in four different venues in three different countries over two years. Just transporting it from New York to Las Vegas has taken 65 semi-trucks. That's the uh, empty back end of probably truck number 59 or something that we've unloaded so far. Very civilized loading facilities here compared to what we've experienced in a lot of other places. Assembling the grid, the stage, the props, and more, and modifying all of it to fit into a new theater takes an army of highly skilled craftspeople. In the building right now, we would have about a... 100, 120 guys. Oh, we're all kind of theater guys, technician guys. I got some people, I personally come from like legit theater. I used to do Shakespeare, I used to do musicals, things like that, and I just kind of uh, wound up uh, here at the circus. Computer-aided design, or CAD, helps the build team to stay on track. So this is where it all began in the schematic stage, right? So we've, we've taken a, a 3D drawing and that eventually through a lot of evolution and uh, fabrication turns into what we were looking at on stage. One of the team's biggest challenges has been fitting such a large elaborate set into older theaters. Fortunately, ARIA's modern facilities gives the team the space it needs to construct this modern show. So this is when I'm talking about the luxury of space here. The back wall at Radio City Music Hall is about where this wall is here, right? That's an LED screen that's uh, sort of 40 by 90. And the back brick wall at Radio City Music Hall is about three feet behind that. And here we have about 40 or 50 feet behind that. It's a, a luxury of having probably four or five trucks worth of equipment back there that right now would be sitting on the street waiting to be loaded in in New York because we don't have the space, right? Churchill and his team spend painstaking hours assembling the grid and bringing the stage to life. It takes roughly three weeks to get it ready for the artists and acrobats. For everybody involved in Zarkana's production, it has been an exciting journey with an even more exciting end in a theater that brings the audience right up to the action. The theater is amazing. The theater, you know, we did the Radio City in, in, in New York, that's 6,000 people in the house, and people were so far from the stage. The way the, the theater is built, is, for me, it's amazing because I have the feeling they are close to the stage, and I love it. Even, you know, the balcony, you feel like, you, compared to Radio City, you feel like you can touch them. So it's definitely a huge, huge change and a, a very big positive change for the artists that feel a contact with the audience like uh, so much more in here. With its arrival in Las Vegas, Zarkana finally has a place it can call its own, a place it can call home. For me, it's a nice and huge privilege to open this show here in Aria, you know. The side of me feels like a little bit home. And that's what I feel, you know, the energy is really strong here. It's, it's hard not to look at this with a sense of pride because it's, it's really one of the most beautiful shows I've ever seen, let alone worked on. It's so rich. I mean, the textures, the lighting, the video, the fabrics, it's just stunning how it all changes from scene to scene and the lights change and the video change and the music changes and you're somewhere completely different. Before the acrobats even start, it's just, wow, look at that. And then the good part starts as well, right? To find out more about Zarkana, visit CirqueDuSoleil.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org slash artbeat, where you'll find featured videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation was made possible by contributions to aid from viewers like you. Thank you.